ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Wondergraph AMA Special Edition Launch Week. Today, we have another very special guest for our AMA, Robert Balicki. Did I pronounce that correctly? It's uh, Balicki, but it's kind of hard to go from English diction to Polish diction, so I go by Balicki. Balicki, okay, okay. I didn't know you were Polish. Well, awesome, awesome. True. Very cool yeah. to meet you. So, welcome to the AMA. Thank you. Excited awesome. to be here. Amazing. So for those of you that don't know Robert, Robert is a software engineer or staff software engineer at Pinterest. He's the organizer of the Rust NYC meetup, author of Smithy, a framework for writing WebAssembly apps in Rust, as well as Isograph. Robert, super, again, super excited to have you here. If you want, feel free to give a small introduction of anything I might have missed or anything, you know, some cool facts about you or anything like that. Uh, no, in terms of technical stuff, you got, you got the gist of it. Um, the, I guess the other relevant thing here is while I was at Facebook, I was on the relay team. Um, and yeah, huge fan of, huge fan of GraphQL, huge fan of relay, as you might expect. Um, other than that, what I played in the band in high school, I had hair down to my shoulders. Um, that's my usual fun fact I give in, in situations like this. So. Love that. Love that. So the way we usually start these off is we go through the background and then we get into the main topic, which is why you should relay give relay another look in GraphQL. So that's my really bad pun for today. So no more of those, but let's get started into it. So you have a very interesting background. So you started off as a news reporter and so you were into journalism. So it took for a couple of years. So walk me through that. So back when I was in high school, I think I made basically two good decisions, one of which was joining the uh, speech and debate club, and one of which was doing journalism uh, starting my senior year. So I didn't, I wasn't ever, ever employed as a journalist. Um, but I did end up doing a lot of uh, writing and I interned in Sacramento, which is the state capital of California. And just in general, being able to go from an outline to a speech or from an outline to a uh, an article is just super helpful skill has uh, accrued benefits over the, my entire life. Like writing is an important thing, especially now that everybody is remote and writing um, is the primary way that we communicate in large organizations. Um, so without any foresight, I made two good decisions and I'm very happy with that. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's my uh, journalism background. Actually, interestingly, both of my parents are, uh, they're hardware engineers. And so at the time I wanted to rebel against that because I was an angsty teenager. So that's why I ended up going into journalism to try to, you know, maybe, maybe end up as a lawyer or a, a journalist or a politician, probably not a politician realistically, but um, to rebel against that. And then I went to college and I was like, wait a second, why am I rebelling? Like they're so far away now. And I drifted back into the same orbit. But in the meantime, I had picked up some writing skills, which I think are very helpful. Love that. And I would totally agree. Writing, you know, and being able to go from outline to idea, especially right now in a remote distributed world, it's probably one of the most important skills you can have. And it's kind of funny, you, you decided to rebel and then you you came into the same bad, so full circle. So love that. And so while you were doing your, your career, I guess, as a reporter and then after high school, you started a company called Modern Benchmark. So walk me through what Modern Benchmark is and like how you went through founding it. Yeah. Um, so between college and Modern Benchmark, I worked at a company that did um, market research on the temporary staffing industry. And a lot of what I did was working in Excel and building charts and, and building presentations and PowerPoint and stuff like that. And so just over time, I started to automate increasing amounts of my job. Um, and at the end of that, I decided that uh, I thought I had what could turn into a very good product. And in particular, um, I ended up building or teaching myself the program plus building um, a platform for doing data analysis that's specified in advance. So the idea was that companies in the same industry, um, i.e. those who would otherwise have somebody else do their benchmarking, would get together, agree upon a survey, and then everybody would, would conduct the survey. So the reason this is better than the existing alternative was that the existing alternative, somebody looks at your data. So it's inherently um, sort of dangerous that you're sharing sort of the crown jewels with somebody else. They can hold on to it. They can use it against you. They can accidentally share it, you know, whatever. Um, secondly, 
even if you're talking to the uh, VP of analysis and he's got a PhD or he or she has a PhD and all that, it's probably some 22 year old straight out of college actually doing the data analysis. So, you know, there's no real guarantee that it's being done correctly um, or even that you're getting what you actually asked for. And thirdly, the economics of doing this kind of stuff in Excel or what have you, like don't, don't really make sense because it's additional work to do like additional cuts, but like that should just be basically free. Um, you should be able to get an, a lot of cuts and a lot of value without any additional labor going into to that uh, to that report. So that was the gist. Um, I ended up working on that for about a year and a half or so. And at the end of that, realized that I was not doing any marketing or outreach or anything like that. And it was not going to magically turn into a company. Um, so at that point in time, I started to I realized I wasn't locked down. So I started working remotely and traveling and I ended up going to Chicago and then Boston and uh, New York. And my plan was once it got cold, get the heck out of Dodge. But I actually really, really like New York and have no intention of leaving. So love that. And you touched on a very important point, which is um, you can have all the technical skills you want. But when you start a company, you have to make sure that you do marketing. You have to make sure you do sales and you have to make sure you do outreach. So fantastic point. And I'm glad you took the learnings and you found a place which is home. New York, I think, is probably my second favorite city. I'm a little biased because I live in Miami, but New York is a fantastic place. Uh, yeah, it's my second favorite city. Which one, Miami? Miami, yeah, yeah. Okay, then. When I come visit you in New York, you'll come visit me in Miami. Vice versa, yeah, yeah. Perfect. And so then after that, you joined ADP as a technical architect, and you were there with them for about a year. How would you describe your experience there? Like any learnings or anything interesting that came from there? Um, I think one thing that is interesting about my time at ADP was the way I was interviewed. I mean, I had had a lot of side projects, um, just, and while I was interviewing, I was showing off one of them and we encountered a bug and just in real time, I was like, I know exactly what's going on. It was some angular app and probably there was no, you know, some prop wasn't being passed down or whatever. So I fixed it in real time, deployed it and you know, showed them a working version, like, you know, 10 seconds later. Um, and I remember the interviewers telling me that they'd never seen a, an app be updated live, like during an interview before, and they were somewhat impressed by that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, maybe if you're trying to get a tech job, like have side projects and update them in real time. Um, but ADP was a real fun place to work. I actually met a lot of good friends there. Um, it was a very social place, which was which was awesome. Um, ADP is based in New Jersey, but I was in the New York uh, Innovation Lab, um, so that was a lot of fun. We were sort of like experimenting with a lot of different ways to present um, very interesting things like I nines and you know tax forms and things like that. No, actually, it's I mean anything that's anything that's boring if you get deep into it enough, like it's it becomes inherently interesting. So I didn't actually think it was boring. Um, but yeah, that was fun. That was an Angular shop. Um, we experimented a little bit with React, but like, as of when I was there, it was not um, it was not all that adopted. So. Love that. And I, I love, love what you said. So the key takeaway from this, so if you guys are interviewing for a job and you have side projects, right before the interview, introduce a bug that you know how to solve, and then in real time on the interview, solve the bug. It'll impress the interviewers. Is that what we can get away from that, Robert? Actually, I think... I think you probably could pull that off and I don't, <laughs> I think it would work. Um, preparation is extremely important for interviews. Like, and if you have the preparation to pull that off, you've probably done a lot of other steps that are also important, but like, yes, I think that would work at the margin. <laughs> so. I love that. And then after that, you spent about two and a half years at Jetty and then three years, almost four years at, Home team. So I'm not familiar with home team, but how was the experience at Jetty? Jetty and home team were both startups. Um, home team, we sold home care for the elderly. And I mean, this was like a scheduling platform for that. Um, and I mean, the pl product I worked on was sort of like the internal tool in the sch scheduling platform, but like we also hired the uh, home care, uh, home care folks. And at Jetty, we sold renter's insurance online. Um, both of these I would describe as sort of fairly standard startups, um, not necessarily differentiated by their tech. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was a really fun experience. It was I learned a lot. Like, I think you can get a lot out of working at a startup if you just never stop trying to change things around you and, you know, just get your hand in every little nook and cranny and, um, you know, just do a lot of stuff. Um, I think I, yeah, I mean, it was, it was fun. I was fun. I, I don't know. I don't have something super deep to say about them. So I apologize about that. Yeah. No, no, totally fine. And then during Jetty and home team ADP, were you introduced to GraphQL in any of those scenarios or was it when you joined no, Facebook? No, no, no. We considered join, adopting GraphQL at Jetty, but then we didn't before I had left. Interesting. Uh, and why didn't you guys decide to adopt it? Because it was, it was relatively new around the time when you were at Jetty. So was there a reason you guys decided not to adopt it? Um, I think it was sort of institutional inertia. And also, yeah. like, frankly, I don't think it would have made, been the right decision. Um, because the number of API calls we were making was very small. And so it is easy enough to maintain five REST endpoints. And the lift of converting a very small API to GraphQL like didn't justify this additional work. Um, the company had like a strong distinction between like the front end folks and the back end folks. Um, and I think that had more mostly to do with like just the first two engineers set it up that way. And mm -hmm. then over time, it just, you know, we just kind of maintained that. Um, and that was lower hanging fruit to fix is sort of like integrate the teams rather than um, change the, the format, uh, the wire format between which or with which the front and the back end communicated. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was early. I, I, I remember at the time, like I was aware that relay existed, but I had mostly heard of Apollo. So I was like, well, of course, if we do adopt it, we would adopt Apollo. Um, and then I just sort of, we never did. I never thought about it again. So interesting. And I love the honesty. And so then after home team, you joined Facebook where you were there for about four years and you worked on relay. So did you immediately start on the relay team or did you immediately start somewhere else? What was the experience like at Facebook or meta, I guess now? Uh, so, so it was, it was home team, then Jetty, then, then, uh, Facebook. Uh, yeah. but yeah, it was, I, I immediately joined the, the relay team. Um, I was actually intent on joining a team that used Rust and the, there was an internal document listing the teams that use Rust. Only two teams in New York were on that document, both of which had no headcount. So I was a little bummed. I was like, whatever, I'll learn C++ and you know, like I'll join a C++ team. Um, and I was looking at our internal GitHub version, we call it Fabricator, um, and looking at PRs that were landing that touched Rust files and then looking at the author and looking up in the, like the, the space view tool to see where they sat. Um, and I noticed that there was a, a change to a Rust file and the person was like a hundred feet from me. I was like, what the hell? Uh, so I go and sit down, uh, next to Tianyu and I'm like, Hey, I'm joining your team. And he was like, you should probably talk to my boss. And so I talked to, uh, Seth Webster and, um, I told him and he was like, well, we should probably like talk to the team, but we do have a headcount coming up. Um, it was soft promise to somebody else, but you're kind of like, you're able to, to get it if you want it. And so I got it. And that's how I joined yeah. the relay team. And I was, uh, it was, I mean, honestly, it's just been like the best learning experience I ever, like it was, a, it's a, it's an ambitious project. It's an ambitious code base. There's a lot to learn. And right after I joined, I met my team. I was in the middle of doing sort of the, the 101 onboarding stuff and then COVID happened. And so I was like, well, whatever, I'll wait until I come back into the office to finish these. And then I just never finished them. So um, honestly, like, it's just, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity to have been on the, on the relay team. And I feel like I really lucked into it. Um, I had no idea what um, I was getting myself into or anything like that, or, or how central I think, Relay and GraphQL are to Facebook. I didn't know that at the time. Um, you know, the probably the default path was that I would have ended up on some team maintaining some sort of internal tool or external facing product. But like, you know, being being a product engineer, 
Um, and working on a framework is much more exciting for me. So I think that worked out, worked out quite well. That's actually a great transition. So before we transition into the isograph, I want to ask, so I, I don't think you lucked in. I think you, you saw what you wanted and you kind of went and you made it happen. And then the luck was, you know, being to work on Relay, which is amazing. So I like the initiative that you took. That's, you know, you wanted to work on something that touched trust and you went and you did it. So that's awesome. And then during the time at Facebook, is this when you developed Isograph? And if so, what no. is Isograph? When, when was Isograph developed? Isograph was developed after I got laid off in, uh, or I was affected by the layoffs in <laughs> April of this year. I had like the idea for Isograph um, in my head at the time. And, but I hadn't really done any work on it. Um, the gist is as follows. I mean, one, I think Relay has a very good, um, Relay is very, very good. It does a lot of things exactly right. It has, it pre-calculates a lot of things. It creates normalization ASDs and reader ASDs. So you don't have to do a lot of parsing and processing of uh, query text and fragment text at runtime, meaning that it can perform better than uh, comparable frameworks. It has a compiler so it can statically discover a lot of things um, such as the fragments um, and the actual query text that you will be sending. And therefore you can do a lot of other things in advance such as prevent um, fragments which are statically impossible to ever be needed such as if they're behind a variable like an include if where that variable is hard coded to, to false. Um, and you can get the query text in advance. So the server can process the query text and do whatever. It, it, it can basically create a query plan if it, if it needs to. Um, and in particular, that also means that Relay can do stuff like um, you can pre-register the query text and replace it with an ID. So actually at runtime, if you, you, know, if you go to facebook.com and inspect your network um, tab, you will find that we're not sending query texts or sending our query IDs and variables. And that's great because one, the query text doesn't need to come down in the initial payload and it doesn't need to go back up in the uh, in the actual, you know, the payload to, to make a mutation or make a query or whatever. Um, all of these things are great. I absolutely love that about Relay. I think it's for, for most use cases, it is just so good. Um, I think we should invest more in making it easy to adopt in open source, which I think Wondergraph is doing. And so I'm very, very happy about that. Um, the things that I wanted to see done differently in Relay um, are pretty much what I sort of built Isograph to do, um, to sort of scratch that itch and to experiment with that. Um, I don't actually think it's a bad thing that this, what I'm adopting in, in Isograph is not in Relay. Relay powers Facebook. Facebook is, you know, a bajillion, scrillion different fragments and queries, like making changes there um, that affect all of those is going to be very, it's, it's, it's a big lift. Um, and so just from my personal scratch my own hitch perspective, it makes sense to have it be a separate framework. Okay. That being said, why, uh, why Isograph? The big difference between Isograph and Relay is that in Isograph, everything is a resolver. So a resolver is a function from some graph data to an arbitrary value. Um, and a typical resolver might be a you know, full name field or something like that, where at compile time, we replace this full name field with a selection for first name and last name. And then sort of at read time, we call some function that concatenates the two and gives you the full name. Um, but from the backend's perspective, this resolver does not exist. It's just the query selects both first name and last name. Um, that's all fine and dandy, but why not components? We can actually do that. It's, it takes a little bit of, you know, sort of uh, work under the, under the hood to sort of make it work with respect to React's reconciliation algorithm. Um, but the point is it's, it's doable. And so Isograph is basically asking the question, what if everything was a resolver? And so that means that in practice, uh, the way you build screens with Isograph is that, like, so for example, the home screen, you might select the header, the body, and the footer, 
and just interpolate those. And the header selects your avatar, and the body selects, I don't know, the current post, and the footer selects whatever else um, information that you need. So yeah, that's the, that's the big that's the big difference. Um, the second thing that uh, sort of change I've had with with Isograph is that um, instead of writing GraphQL, you actually write Isograph language, and that is something that compiles to GraphQL. Uh, one of the things that I realized is that GraphQL the servers understand GraphQL, but the actual code that you write in your components, it as long as it compiles to GraphQL, you're you're, you're fine. And I think that GraphQL is a great language for many things, um, but in some, in in a lot of ways, it's like it's subpar. And on the relay team, we had trouble experimenting with changes to syntax because changes to syntax would break uh, the syntax highlighting and auto formatting and, and stuff like that inside of you know in, inside of VS Code. So sort of there's the trade-off. Like, do you want to ship all these changes upstream in order to have them in your tool, or do you just want to have a completely new syntax, meaning that you are responsible for syntax highlighting, which doesn't exist, and auto formatting and, and all this kind of stuff. And I ended up going with the, the second route because I want to include in Isograph a few other features that are currently not um, easily doable in GraphQL without um, sort of excessive use of uh, directives. Directives are, um, I mean, they're easy to slap on anything. So like sort of everything can be done with directives, um, but I don't think it's elegant. Um, and I don't that's think it's like, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, that's the big, that's sorry. Yeah, that's the big, those are some of the big differences between Isograph and, and, and Relay. So we got some questions from the audience, and I'm actually very interested in what they've said. So they said, what is the future of Isograph, and where would you like it to be in five years? Um, so Isograph is not feature complete, and it won't be feature complete if I'm the only one working on it. I mean, uh, most likely, anyway. So my hope is that over time, um, there's a big community of contributors who are able to help out and bring this help bring this vision to life. Um, I think that the developer experience and the power at your fingertips that Isograph can potentially give you is like, I mean, it motivates me. And so I'm hoping it also motivates other people in the community uh, to continue helping out. But I think there's a many steps that are involved in getting Isograph from where it is now, proof of concepts, a few interesting things that you'll see at, at GraphQL Conf, to um, you know feature parity with Relay, to being able to do some of the really cool things that that I hope it's able to do. Um, one specific example, for example, uh, since components are exposed in the graph, that means that if you are new to a code base and you drop in and you say, "I'm building a user detail page." I've never seen a single file in this code base in my life. You will be able to have um, autocomplete and other like sort of discoverability for all the components that are available on user. So you won't need to rewrite the user avatar because the user avatar component exists and it's being surfaced to you. Um, you maybe aren't even that familiar with GraphQL or with front end, uh, front end development. You might just be able to say, hey, there's a user detailed blurb let me like click and drag that into this thing and all of the uh plumbing of saying now this user has this fragment which ends up getting passed to this and therefore we have to have this, this the javascript for the user blurb um, all just sort of works for you so i think it'll um, i mean my real goal is that it makes it a lot easier for somebody who's not familiar with the code base and also for people who are not super familiar with front-end development to be able to just drop in and be instantly productive um, you kind of imagine retool, but like mm -hmm. powered by GraphQL and not just for, um, you know, sort of internal dashboards, but like actually a, a full power thing. Um, the other long-term thing, uh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely happy to talk about <laughs> why GraphQL is so far. Um, the other long-term <laughs> thing that I, uh, like uh, other North Star vision that I have for, for 
um, isograph is that I think that like because the because components are first class um, entities in uh, in in isograph, it makes sense in isograph to answer to be able to say things like this. Like let's say you have your header, body, and footer. And you might be able to get analytics that say, hey, this footer is not rendered on screen for 99% of users. So let's just defer um, the data for the, the data for the footer, sorry, for the footer, not for the header, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Defer the data for the footer and also defer the JavaScript for the footer. Right now that's possible, but you just have to do it in two separate steps and who knows whether they're, you, you actually do both. Um, yeah. There's nothing enforcing this. But secondly, defer currently is one of two things. It's either fetch this data with the parent or fetch it immediately afterward, um, as, you know, essentially. But there should be a third one, which is fetch it at some arbitrary point in time in the future. And that also means that it makes sense for Isograph to suggest to the back end things like, this footer is never rendered. One rendering and fetching data, like for, for data that you just fetch, like there's no concept of rendering or being on screen. Okay, so this is never on screen. Um, so why don't you not fetch that data, still include it as part of the parent query, but like have it be essentially behind and include if uh, that starts at false. Um, just imperatively fetch that data when this component is 600 pixels from being rendered on screen because the amount of time that it takes for a user to scroll 600 pixels is about the amount of time that it would take for that query to be fulfilled. I don't know, whatever math you, you choose, what you can do is have this app that like by default, only the stuff that's above the fold comes in with the initial network request and all the other stuff just sort of like pops in as you scroll, as you navigate and the framework in Isograph is the only framework for which it makes sense to have this kind of analytics that suggest this, these kind of improvements. Um, so one thing that's nice about this is like, I just said imperatively load the footer, um, along with, you know, the JavaScript and the data for the footer, uh, that's basically entry points right out of the box. So, um, if you're familiar with, you know, with that, like that's kind of nice because entry points are, they're difficult to, to implement in other frameworks. Um, yeah, like that's, that's sort of the vision that I have. Um, actually real quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll flesh out the vision fully for, for what, what I wanted by doing. Yes. This is also a good, um, transition to this current question, which is why is GraphQL subpar? Um, one thing that I think one need that is not fulfilled by, uh, frameworks that provide a normalized store is that it is impossible to, um, prevent you from rendering missing data. That's fine on facebook.com because if you, we don't know the author of a blog post or something like that, or author of a post or page, you know, it could be by unknown, or it could be just that field could be missing. And like, nobody's really devastated by that. But if you're on a page, if you're on like a banking app and you don't know the current price or the current amount of money in your account or the current price of some security, like that's actually pretty bad. And the economics of this are a bit different. Like Facebook has, you know, maybe 2 billion users. I don't actually know. Um, and uh, each of those contributes very little money to Facebook. Um, but like overall, it adds up to a very big pie. But if you're thinking of a banking app where every individual um, contributes, you know, pays a hundred bucks per month for, for access to this, to the Bloomberg terminal powered by GraphQL or whatever, then yeah, like if it's more expensive to um, always, to never show missing data, like it makes sense, you can do that. Um, so I'm thinking that like, one thing I really want in Isograph is the ability to precisely control what data we show um, in what situations, meaning that you should be able to write a fragment or write a component where you're showing the current asset price and if it's missing, that fragment will necessarily suspend. And that only happens in Relay, for example, if there's a query that's in flight um, that could potentially fulfill that field. Um, and in Isograph, the solution that I want to let you opt into is to basically, if any component suspends, we sort of go up the tree until we find the nearest refetchable boundary 
automatically generate a query for that, like at compile time, and then just refetch that query. So the reason that you can't prevent this from happening in a framework that has a normalized store is you imagine like you have a component that shows your best friend's name and then a separate component rendered later that shows your best friend's avatar. In the meantime, your best friend has changed. So now when you render the second component with the best friend's avatar, you now have a new best friend. So the first one re-renders, finds that the new best friend, we've never selected the name. So now you like have an unknown name uh, or you, you know, maybe you, maybe you throw, maybe you just should render missing data, whatever. Just in general, as relationships can change, and if they're normalized in the store, it, you might end up with missing data. Um, so one thing you might notice is that like none of none of what I've said really um, is not doable in Relay. And I do hope that um, a lot of what I, you know, I'm just experimenting with ends up in other frameworks that we, you know, with, with greater adoption. Um, yeah. Okay. Why is GraphQL so far? <laughs> GraphQL I'm excited about this one. Yeah. Um, GraphQL is subpar for a number of reasons, some of which are being actively fixed in GraphQL right now. Um, one is, but like the biggest one is that fragment spreads are on the parent object. Um, so you might like spread a fragment on user and then it goes sort of like on the user object. And then you pass the fragment reference down to the child and what you're passing is the user not like user dot whatever. Um, and I think that that's like a pretty big mistake. I understand exactly why it was, why the, the decision was made, but I think it's a mistake in retrospect. And one thing that is bad about that is in particular, if you have um, interfaces. So if you have a, a fragment on, if you have a node type, node is an interface and you spread an actor and not all node concrete types that implement node, implement actor, and um, you actually have no way to check um, whether this node object implements actor. Meaning that if you try to read that actor fragment, um, the framework has to make a, you know, a subpar choice, like either assume it implements actor or assume it doesn't. And uh, like, Either of those is a bad choice because we really want to just be able to render that if this actually implements actor. Um, so of course you can yourself like do like a dot 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 on actor and then select like is actor colon type name and check for the presence of that field. But like that doesn't propagate to the types. Um, you can still make mistakes. It's it's not easy to enforce that uh, kind of checking. Not a lot of people know to do that really, um, and it really only blows up in like you know some small percent of cases most of the time. So like. Uh, that's like one example where I, I don't think GraphQL is a good, um, where, where I don't think GraphQL is good. I think GraphQL is good in one very concrete sense. And that is that it is composable, like fragments are composable. And you can, like there's this two level thing of fields and fragments. And like ultimately, like you have this tree of fields and if a, if a field is like included in some parent query and this like child query, this child fragment is deferred, like you can kind of move it out and pu pu pull it into the parent and stuff like that. And so it's like this really, really flexible language for expressing the data you need that can be used to generate very efficient queries, which I think is really, really awesome. And I think that that's um, not related to GraphQL as a server specification. Per se, and I think that there's a version of um, some sort of GraphQL-like thing that ultimately compiles to SQL, that ultimately compiles to gRPC or or whatever that like is waiting to be discovered, and um, and at that point in time, like it's a little bit less obvious why you would use GraphQL, but I still think right now like the composability is the killer is the killer feature of GraphQL, and. Um, Honestly, I'm kind of curious as to why it's not been done in SQL and and so on and so forth. Interesting. Uh, I would take. Uh, I mean, there was a lot to unpack there, but with back to isograph. So when you, after your time at Facebook and with Relay, that's when you started to implement and start on isograph. What learnings did you take from Relay to implement into isograph? Um, I mean. 
pretty much everything. Like Relay is an open source project. I think overall, uh, overall, like it's it works extremely well. It's like I am very much not changing the a lot of what works for Relay in Isograph. Normalization ASDs, reader ASDs. Um, eventually, a bunch of other stuff will like more or less be the same. Um, and so I think like the like the vast majority of things in Isograph are the same. It is different lipstick on a um, on the same animal. Um, yeah, I think that like the big takeaway I have from Relay that's not specific to Relay or anything is like you can do a lot of work in advance um, and it is it is a good idea to generate artifacts that um, allow you to pr not do that work at runtime um, and that, I mean, that's basically like Relay's secret performance sauce. And I think that that's a good, I think that's a pretty good takeaway. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I like that. And so on the topic of Relay, so Jens, he tweeted a while ago, uh, any comparison of GraphQL versus whatever that fails to mention Relay is almost always useless. Even TRPC comparisons completely fail to understand fragments. It's very easy to dismiss the complexity of GraphQL when you fail to understand the core value of the query language. So this tweet blew up. And one of the most famous, or I wouldn't even say famous, I guess famous in our circle, is somebody quote tweeted it saying, with Relay, the only way you can kind of understand Relay is if you have two PhD degrees. Is Relay really that hard to adopt? And this was a pretty big influencer or tech influencer that quote tweeted this. But like, what, why isn't Relay client more popular? And why do people think you need two PhDs to adopt Relay? Do you really have to be a genius to implement it? Um, I don't think you should have to be. I think that we didn't do a good job of prioritizing open source adoption and making it easy, uh, and just generally prioritizing that. Like, I think that's honestly like a, we tried, but just the, the dynamics of working at a big company is that, you know, the company's bottom line ultimately pays the bills. And so I think we insufficiently prioritize that. Um, I don't think it's impossible to make Relay easy to adopt. I don't think it's even that necessarily. I don't know that it's that difficult. I feel like it's just a lot of like initial work. And so some sort of like create Relay app style thing that just gets you to the right starting position might be 70% of the work. I think Wondergraph is doing something like that. So I'm actually like super excited to learn about uh, making Relay easy to adopt in Wondergraph. Um, but yeah, I don't think that that's, um, I, I think it mostly has to do with the fact that like the setup is more difficult than it should be. Um, I don't think it's that once you have a Relay app, it is difficult to build components in it or anything like that. Because the opposite is very obviously true, which is that Relay does a lot of the work for you and it allows multiple developers in the same code base to move quickly. Yes. Um, and, you know, yeah. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a given. So. And I, I think you kind of hit it on the head. Yeah, somebody also tweeted at it that as far as they know, that React or the Relay is seldomly used outside of Facebook. And I mean, at the end of the day, you're right. A, a company needs to make money. And so it's a little bit difficult sometimes to invest into open source tooling. But on the topic of open source tooling, and GraphQL, where do you see the future of GraphQL? I know that Isograph is there, but what other companies do you see that are pushing the narrative forward for open source tooling and GraphQL? And where do you want to see GraphQL in the next couple of years? Um, I I don't know more about this than you do. <laughs> I think WonderGraph is doing great things. I'm actually super excited about it. Um, I, I mean, there's a few, there's a few people that are like building on GraphQL, um, in ways that I think are, are really, really good. I think that, um, I, 
I think that it would be really nice. Well, I think that the, the potential of GraphQL tooling and so on is not fully realized. Um, and it probably won't be as long as the graph doesn't have first class resolvers, which return components in it, not to, you know, sort of toot my own horn or anything, but, um, <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know if you remember one graph, I think one graph was kind of like this, um, one graph, had like uh, a graph. they became with D graph, right? Is that the same? I, maybe I, um, uh, I think they yeah. were acquired by Netlify, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They were yeah, 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 yeah. It was Sean Grove and, and his co-founder. Um, now and, they're, um, they're Netlify Connect. And real quick, just, just to interject on this, there's so many companies that want to do this. They want to be the universal data layer. Like, is that like where you're going with GraphQL, where it could eventually be this thing that connects everybody together? I think that would be a good, um, I think that would be a good goal to have. Um, and I think it's entirely possible for front ends to be able to do more work to, um, overcome the fact that these aren't actually the same graph, like that you have to, you know, make a bunch of requests. So for example, I've talked to my friends at other companies who are adopting GraphQL. And one of the issues that they often encounter is that they have sort of top level endpoints, which are individual API backends. And then like this one might, you know, the first API might give you a list of users. And then you have a second one, which is the user API. And so that used to be first request the users list and then request the users individually. Um, like that typical uh, sort of waterfall problem. And now it's just a waterfall problem, but in GraphQL. So GraphQL doesn't really like, it doesn't add anything there. Um, and I think that like front ends should be able to uh, smooth that over by saying like, anytime we encounter a user ID, um, and you still just pretend it's a user and then turn that into a network waterfall request on the front end. Like, obviously you don't want to make it easy to have network waterfalls. Um, but like you also sometimes have two APIs that aren't connected properly and the backend doesn't know how to do that. I mean, maybe the backend could also do the stitching. That's a, a better solution than what I'm suggesting. Um, but like if front ends were more powerful, you could have situations where like, yeah, you get a user ID and you need a name, whatever. It turns into an additional waterfall network request. Like, eh, it's not the end of the world. But like, at least it works. At least it shows you the developer experience that uh, you want to be able to give to your developers um, and so on. Uh, I don't have a good answer for what I, where I want the, the ecosystem to, to be, other than the fact that I think like, if we do have a world where, um, sort of types are shared or like IDs at least can, can exist across multiple um, backends, then you can have a situation where you just build a single query and maybe you select like a, a user avatar, but like that comes from a different library and it all just kind of like stitches together into a series of queries that like then end up uh, working for your web app and the amount of effort that you as a web developer have to put in um, is minimal. And then if you care about performance, like the, there's obvious ways to improve the performance, but like as a first pass, you should be able to just get the correct thing out, not the correct thing, get, get something out the door very easily. Um, because for 99% of cases, who cares about performance, the internal tool, like everybody who's using it is on, you know, a extremely fast connection. Um, and that's okay. Maybe you have more loading states than you need. That's also okay for internal tools. And if you're a startup just trying to figure, figure out product market fit, like performance isn't necessarily what you should be cared about, caring about. You should care about like whether customers are gelling with your product, not with whether you can shave 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds or even a second off of the API call. Um, yeah, I guess ease of development is I think the what I would hope to see. And I love that you said that about performance. So a big thing about us is um, 
Um, how familiar are you with like what, what we've launched this week for launch week? Nothing, nothing. I'm not, not familiar at all. I'm busy preparing my GraphQL talk, so enlighten me. Okay, so Tuesday we launched Open Federation, a open source federation spec that follows Apollo Federation. This one's MIT because we saw that Apollo Federation was just a list of directives, no real directions, and so we released Open Federation. And you can check it out here. We link it. Low. But we're in partnership with the Guild, so it's a community-driven source initiative to create and maintain a specification for federated GraphQL APIs. And I'll post that up in the stream. So that was Tuesday. And your answer was very interesting when you said, um, I think where you're at Jetty or the other one where you were thinking of about adopting GraphQL. And the main company there at the time was Apollo. And what we've noticed in the market is that it's kind of become a closed source offering with very tricky licenses and things like that. So Tuesday, we released WonderGraph Cosmo. Cosmo is a drop-in replacement for Apollo. Mm -hmm. Studio, router, everything that Apollo has, except open source under Apache 2.0. And so that was Tuesday. And then today was performance, which I think is super funny that you said that because for us, especially for a startup, Performance doesn't matter until somebody tells you that it's not fast enough. And we had somebody tell us, like, it's really fast, but we're a huge company. We have billions of requests coming through. We need it to be a little bit faster. So today, we released our High Performance Federation we, V1 and V2 routers. And I'm going to link it here as well because you can see the comparisons between Gateway, Router, WonderGraph Gateway, GraphQL Mesh, and others. And then you can see how Cosmo performs compared to those. And then you can check those out whenever you want, I'll send them to you after. But what's interesting, I think it's funny. So WonderGraph router is written in Golang, while the other routers are written in Rust. And I know that you like Rust, so I wanted to get your feedback on, if you want to build a performant router, why would you use Golang and not Rust? Uh, I'm definitely a Rust fanboy. I think you should, I think Rust is a better language for the same reason that Relay is better than writing your own GraphQL queries in that you do some upfront work, but you ultimately get something where um, more people can touch the same code base without breaking it because many of the assumptions are baked into, uh, you know, are baked into the, the, the types, which is not the case with, with Go. Um, I'm not too familiar with Go. Like, honestly, like I, I'm sure it's great code, uh, but I, <laughs> just a big Rust fanboy, I think that like leaning heavily on the, the type system is a great way to, um, I don't know, it's a great way to grow as a developer and it's a great way to build an app where um, you can just basically do type Tetris. So, you, you know, half your mind is not there and uh, because you're tired and you update the, the struct you know, like you ultimately know that this this struct needs this field. You update it, and suddenly it tells you here's the ten places where you're not providing that field. Like, and you go to each of those, and you're just like you you provide it, and eventually you end up at a place where like, oh, hopefully it makes sense because I can get it from this previous struct to this guy, and like we weren't doing that previously or, or whatever. Um, whenever I can do a fairly large refactor in a fairly mechanistic way, because I'm relying on the on a Rust type system. Like I'm very happy with that, um, and I don't think that that's something that's ever going to come to go, because the type system is very limited by comparison. Um, and I think ultimately that that's not a good that's not good for the long term, because eventually Copilot will not be able to just suggest new lines of code, but we'll like sort of do refactors for mm -hmm. you, or maybe Copilot in, in combination with Rust Analyzer, which is already an extremely, very, extremely powerful, like, you know, sort of refactoring tool. Um, but like, anytime I do a mechanistic code refactor, and it just all kind of works at the end, like one, that makes me extremely happy. And two, I know that like, that's eventually going to be something that I type into a, a chat GPT input and say like hey i want this field on this struct like and it ultimately comes from here so like figure out how to plumb it all the way through um and then i will look at the code and be like yeah you, you have no idea what you're talking about here but like 
seventy percent of this is good. So I don't know. All right, well, that's, that's why. That's why I like this. And so we're almost at time. So last couple questions are just relatively chill and just not even related to GraphQL. So outside of programming and outside of working, you know, as a staff software engineer now at Pinterest, congratulations again. Um, what do you like to do? I know like from your, your bio that you like, well, this is interesting. So on the GraphQL Conf website, it says you like, you love hair metal. What is hair metal? Scorpions, uh, Skid Row, you know, like guys with hair down to their shoulders, dressing up in glam and, you know, like tight clothes and, uh, you know, thrusting on stage and impressive guitar, stuff like that. So. Wait, is it supposed to be heavy metal? It's a genre. It... It's a genre. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's heavy. It's pop music taking the form of heavy metal. Oh, um, okay. So would Slipknot yeah. be considered that? No, 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 no. no. Slipknot is, is not, like, bright and poppy enough. So what are some bands then in hair metal? Because this is the first uh, time I've heard of this genre. Scorpions is probably the biggest hair metal band. Um, Skid Row is another big one. Uh, okay. Dokken. Um, I don't know. There's bands like that. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, I guess Guns N' Roses were kind of sort of hair metal. Oh, okay, uh, okay. A little bit. Um, and the band that did Girls, Girls, Girls. I would. Um, Girls, Motley Crue. Motley Crue. I would. Oh, okay, okay. The, those I think are some of the bigger hair metal bands. Um, I mean, it's just fun. I like really impressive guitar. Um, recently yeah. I saw Pliny live and it was just like so impressive. Like I, like I used to try to play guitar a little bit and like now whenever I go to a live show, I'm like, these guys are so much better than me. I'm like very <laughs> happy that I've like put that behind me. <laughs> Cause like, man, but anyway, very impressive to watch. I love watching people do really technical and fun things like that. So. Love that. And th so then outside of programming and hair metal, what are some other things that you enjoy doing, especially like in New York? Are there any like spots you like, any sports you play, any hobbies that you might have? Uh, I think my hobbies are mostly just like sort of enjoying myself in a way that's not, it's, it's not really a hobby. It's like go out to bars, travel, stuff like that. Um, which is weird because people ask me like, what are my hobbies? I'm like, eh, I kind of got none. Um, but I do like going to shows, going to see comedy, going to see jazz shows, going to like this or that random show. Um, I think there's enough stuff in, to do in New York that you don't necessarily need to have a hobby. And I frankly, especially while I was at Meta, like didn't have time for hobbies. And I, yeah. I, the, I, I filled up my time between Meta and now working on Isograph. So Isograph was a hobby. So. No, well said. And then, so every New Yorker, we always have to ask them, because uh, I have a couple of friends here that have immigrated from New York to Miami. And they're like snowbirds, but they decided to stay permanently. So what's the best pizza spot in New York? I don't like pizza. I think pizza is oh. it's, it's horrible. Like, it's, it's cheap food. Uh, you're in New York. Like, go to better places. <laughs> like, But New York's famous for pizza. Yeah. Yeah. And Okay, yeah. what's your favorite food then in New York? Since I guess you're I'm okay. kind of blown away. I don't even know if you should have done yeah, this. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to like you. blow you away now by saying like I like this like really niche obscure thing. I like burgers. Um, I'm also not a big bagel guy. Uh, oh. <laughs> and the reason I – okay, so so I do like burgers. I think some of the best burgers in um, are at Hall, which is on 20th and 5th. Um, basically at night, it's a $300 a, a person Kaiseki place. And during the day, they could just, um, during the, during the day, they're just preparing like burgers and stuff like that for like, for the lunch crowd. And it's like, it's, it's easy for them, but they create the best possible burgers. And my, my other favorite burger place is Whitman's, which is, uh, I, I go there multiple times a week. Um, they are, they are really, really good. Um, obviously the Asian food here is amazing, um, and I would 100% recommend um, like dollar hot pot and stuff like that. Um, I think honestly, like if you're, I can't live in a city where there's just like Italian food or whatever. Uh, I would get just just very bored and probably I would get fat. I don't I don't like either of those. Um, but anyway, I just I think food is good, and I'm not. Uh, I don't know the best restaurants. I'm well, not a good no. burger in that way. And I, I'm a good, uh, like, I, I like a good burger too. You know, there's some good burger places here. Like, I feel like you can't go wrong with, you know, just a perfectly good cheeseburger. But mm -hmm. okay, well said. 
And then, so we'll see you, uh, GraphQLConf. We're going to have uh, Federetzels at our booth, so make sure you stop by. Do you hate pretzels Ooh. also or no? I will have a Federetzel. Okay, perfect. Well, we won't have pizza and we won't have bagels, but we will have Federetzel. So look out for that. And then, Robert, again, thank you again so much for the time. Like, it was an absolute blast. And thank you for all the work you've done on Relay and Isograph. I'm really looking forward to your talk at GraphQLConf. Yeah, I can't wait to meet you in person in Jens as well. So, yeah. Let's do this. All right, Stefan. Okay. All right. Cheers. Thank you guys so much for tuning out. See you guys tomorrow for Wondergraph AMA with our last two presentations of the week. Thanks, guys. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.